there. Hopefully we'll go back to normal eventually. All right, folks, um, I want to get rolling here and I am going to, let's see, introduce our speakers. Uh, I do ask the people mute while the presentation is going on and um, <clears throat> there will be a PowerPoint presentation and we do have three speakers. Uh, so we got quite the panel and I'm hoping we'll have time for Q&A after, we'll see. Um, but uh, as I said, let's, let's get moving. Um, most of you know that uh, I'm Chuck Ogg and I, um, I'm here for the Rock County Progressives and we are an or, a, not, a nonpartisan organization whose mission is to bring on education and activism here in Rock County. And um, as I said before, for folks who came in, uh, we're probably gonna keep moving, meeting in Zoom, at least for next month. And then we will have a picnic, I believe. Uh, we've already reserved the uh, Northern, uh, North um, Pavilion of the uh, Riverside Park in Janesville. And we're excited to see you all in person. That'll be fun. It's been a long time. And we had to cancel our last years, but we've been doing it for some years, so great. All right, um, now I wanna speak briefly to the topic at hand. Um, I think this is probably one of the most important kind of broad topics that we could tackle. Um, the problem of global climate change or uh, global warming is, dare I say, truly an existential threat to us all. Uh, I wouldn't say it threatens the entire planet, and I wouldn't necessarily even say it threatens uh, the existence of our species and the or, uh, environmental niche around us, but it does perhaps threaten uh, civilization such as it is as we understand it. Uh, you know, collapse looms in the future and major havoc and destruction and war and all that other stuff if we don't do something about it. And so it's really exciting to see groups that are, out, that are out there that are working towards actual solutions, at least to make things um, better in, in the near future. And it's, uh, it's encouraging to see that something can and is being done. And um, we have three, three speakers um, this evening from uh, an organization called Renew Wisconsin. They're a nonprofit organization that promotes renewable energy here in Wisconsin. Since 1991, they've championed, championed clean renewable energy. Um, through advocacy, education, and collaboration, they seek to expand solar power, wind power, biogas, local hydropower, geothermal energy, and the use of electric vehicles. Um, we have, like I said, three uh, members of the team, Heather being their leader. Um, she's worked for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Natural Resources Defense Council, and upon arriving in Madison, the Clean Lakes Alliance, and has even served as legislative analyst for the city of Madison. We also have Jeremy Orr, the Emerging Technology Program Manager, focusing on electric vehicles and emerging technologies. From prior to joining Renew, he served as the Greater Lansing Area Clean Cities Coordinator, where he promoted alternative fuels to diversify the energy market. And lastly, we have Andrew Kell, an energy policy analyst who comes from his graduate studies at UW's La Follette School of Public Affairs. He's had 10 years prior experience at the Public Service Commission of Wisconsin. And this is the point at which I usually say, give them all a big hand. Yeah. Um, you can actually do an electronic version of that if you can figure out how on Skype. So, uh, Okay, guys, uh, now it's your turn. Um, take it away. Uh, thank you, Chuck. What a kind introduction. Um, and thank you, Susan, for getting us here. We're really happy to be here. And um, very excited to talk to you all today and to hear about all the work you all are doing um, on clean energy, climate, and all sorts of other progressive objectives. I am going to share my screen if that's okay. We're going to do a PowerPoint and we're going to go between the speakers. So. Uh, yeah, let me, um, I always forget how to do this now. I have to, multiple, okay, I just did it. Multiple participants can now share screen. Go for it. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so um, tell me how this looks. Does that look okay to you? Looks good to me. 
Okay, fantastic. So uh, thanks for having us. We're just really excited to be here. And I want to give a shout out to my two colleagues, Andrew and Jeremy, who are um, just joined Renew in, in March of this year and are um, already, you know, they just hit the ground running and very excited to be um, working together on, on all these issues. Uh, as you mentioned, these are the things we work on. We're celebrating our 30th anniversary this year. So we're going to have celebrations and lots of ways to engage with Renew. So please join us. Uh, we think fighting for clean energy never gets old. Here's our team. We are nine strong right now, um, which is great. And that that is the largest Renew Wisconsin's ever been. It's an indication of how uh, how the market's growing, how the industry is growing in Wisconsin, and um, all the work that there is to be done in renewable energy. So we're really excited to be growing and, and be, be part of this um, burgeoning process in Wisconsin. Um, today we'll talk a little bit about solar and wind farms and community engagement, distributed generation, electric vehicles, the budget, legislative items, and what it's not on this list, but is of primary importance is how local activists, local governments um, can support the transformation to renewable energy. And I'll turn it over to Andrew. Thanks, Heather. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, you sound good. Good, good. So yeah, I just wanted to quickly go over kind of a snapshot of Wisconsin's current generation fleet for utilities. Um, this was compiled from the New York Times, shows progress over the last 20 years. Coal is still the dominant uh, resource, uh, was 70% back at the turn of the 21st century, and now it's a little bit more, you know, 42%. Uh, uh, but natural gas has, has grown since then, and, and nuclear and other renewable resources have stayed uh, flat. Um, that being said, we'll be talking about the growing renewable resource development that's on the way. Next slide. So this is showing um, the drop up in price for wind and solar, kind of the dominant resources for renewable energy, especially at the utility scale. Uh, the price per kilowatt hour, or this is actually in megawatt hour, has dropped dramatically over the last 10 years, which has enabled utilities to start installing wind and now solar resources at a very fast clip. We're seeing a lot of projects before uh, the Public Service Commission for approval. Next slide. And this is showing in comparison to the levelized cost of coal. So coal is 10.2 cents per kilowatt hour, whereas solar is 4.3 and wind 4.2. Uh, it's very competitive. So uh, economically with fossil fuels, so the price has dropped and utilities are starting to adopt uh, renewable resources at the, uh, at the utility scale, at the transmission level. And you can see their goals here for emissions reductions by 2050. Most of the utilities have a net zero or just zero emissions by 2050. A uh, couple are in alignment with the Paris Climate Accord in 80% reduction by 2050. And the co-ops and unis haven't made a definite commitment yet, but they're on a similar trajectory. Next slide. Pardon me, I was on mute. So this is a map that shows the projects that are um, on the horizon for Wisconsin, uh, the solar and wind projects. And as you can see, Rock County is a hot area for potential solar projects. So it would be great to hear from you what you're hearing about um, developments in Rock County. Um, and uh, you know, if you're hearing local landowners asking questions or, or, or what's going on, in general, um, there are thousands of megawatts of projects in the queue here. Um, we have about almost, we have just over 300 megawatts today. It says 280 on this slide. We need to update that. But um, we have 6,500 6, megawatts of solar proposed in Wisconsin um, at all different stages of, along the development timeline. Not everything on this map will, you know, will get built. But um, if everything on this map was to be built, we would be at about 33% renewable energy. So you can see how many projects need to get through the process, get constructed and get energized so that uh, we could even 
you know, get to a third renewable energy in Wisconsin. So we have a long way to go, but it's, it's happening, um, which is fantastic. I just want to show you this. I'm sorry, I'm just getting used to my screen. <laughs> I want to show you this snapshot of a few solar farms that are already built in Wisconsin. Um, you can see Public Service Commissioner Tyler Hebner in the Downsville project. What's significant here is that, um, you know, we actually think solar farms are really can be seamlessly integrated into the landscape. Um, you can plant these uh, underneath and around the, the projects with pollinator friendly plantings, prairie grasses that help um, create deep roots and help with soil erosion, help with uh, nutrient um, runoff issues and, and even um, capturing water. And so solar farms can be a really great addition to an agricultural um, community in part because of the additional environmental benefits they offer, as well as uh, financial benefits. This is a snapshot of some of these small scale solar farms that have already been built in Wisconsin. Most of these projects are um, from the you know one to five megawatt range. So that's like five to 25 acres or in that range. So fair, we, what we would call a very small solar farm. Um, several of these are owned by Dareland Power um, and those are scattered up and down the western side of the state. Altogether, that's about 35 megawatts of capacity or just over 10% of the total solar in Wisconsin. One project in Manitowoc County, which I'll show you in a second, um, that has been energized accounts for a full half of all the solar in Wisconsin because it's a, it's a very large project. And one of the benefits of large projects any project um, that's over a certain size, and that size is 50 megawatts, will bring in revenue to local governments at a, a rate of about $4,000 4, per megawatt per year. So in the case of uh, uh, the Badger Hollow project, which is in Iowa County, that would bring in 1.2 million per year for 30 years for the life of the project. That is a huge source of revenue, especially for rural local governments. Um, I just mentioned Badger Hollow. That's the project on, on the left of this tiny map on your screen um, the, for the southwest in Iowa County. The Richland County Solar Farm is um, in, the, in the middle of those stars um, in Richland County. That one's right on the Wisconsin River, um, which is it's actually a nice place, a particularly nice place for a solar farm because um, that farm had, that land had been intensively farmed. It took a lot of uh, chemical inputs, it took a lot of water inputs, it was very sandy soil. So now there will be no inputs running straight and they were right at the edge of the Wisconsin River running straight into the Wisconsin River. Um, instead, it'll be generating clean electricity. Um, so that's exciting. And then I mentioned Two Creek Solar Farm that's in Manitowoc County on Lake Michigan that has been energized. That's the largest project operational in Wisconsin today. And I'll turn it over to Jeremy. Thank you, Heather. So this brings us right up into uh, local government and the leadership local government plays. Um, you know, there are currently 147 Wisconsin communities committed to clean energy, which is significant in and of itself. But when you take a look at the slide there, the, the communities that are uh, that are listed, they are devoted to 100% clean energy by 2050. Um, that, that's huge. You know, this is a perfect example of local government leadership um, in clean energy and just setting the example for their communities. And where the previous slide showed local government leadership in clean energy, this is just sort of a, a you know the uh, an outlook in corporations leading the way for clean energy as well. Um, it's the whole multi-sector approach to clean energy, and then why is this important? Well, like we like to say in the the world of sustainability, um, it, it takes a multi-sector approach to solve these issues. In this case, moving towards clean energy. Um, so it's good to see that that actual multi-sector approach right here in Wisconsin. So why do we focus on electric vehicles? Um, you know, 25% of Wisconsin's energy consumption is used for transportation. And, uh, you know, we spent eight $8.2 billion on fossil fuels each year. And, and those fuels come from outside the state of Wisconsin, which leads us to EVs. EVs can be sourced by local renewable energy sources um, like solar, or as we like to say, EVs can drive on sunshine which obviously can cut back our dependence on, on fossil fuels as we move towards cleaner uh, energy sources. 
So this is just a snapshot of Wisconsin's uh, electric vehicle stations, which is kind of the perfect lead into some of the op uh, EV opportunities here in the state. You know, there are efforts across the region to increase charging in and around Wisconsin, you know, in Wisconsin, across the Midwest in general, along corridors, some of the lesser used highways, um, and some of the rural and urban areas that have traditionally been underrepresented. Um, and we'll touch on some uh, legislative and policy items in the coming slides, but you know, I'd just like to say that one of the major areas for EV opportunities right now is just a greater outreach and education to help curtail range anxiety, um, increase general knowledge of electric vehicles, uh, how to locate stations, how to charge and things of that nature. And we do that by, by hosting uh, uh, electric vehicle ride and drives and other such events to just get people out in front of vehicles and get the hands-on experiential learning that's much needed in the industry still. And so we all know that Volkswagen cheated on its uh, diesel emissions testing several years ago, which resulted in states that were affected to receive a certain amount of money. Um, each state can use up to 15% of its allocation specifically for EV stations. Um, however, Wisconsin has not used any of its allocation yet for any EV stations at all. Um, so our governor proposed $10 million to be used for EV stations, which would max us out at 15%. Um, that likely won't happen. What's likely going to happen is we're going to have separate legislation introduced soon uh, for $5 million for EV stations alongside an EV corridor designation grant program. We don't quite know how that's going to look yet as far as the grant program goes. Um, and it's not the 10 million we, we want or anticipated, but it, it's at least a start to get some EV funding out there. And just in general, we advocate for effective policies in the EV market, whether that's helping stakeholders keep informed of, of funding opportunities at the state level, local level, federal level, um, or directly advocating on behalf of industry partners on some of the important legislative items uh, like direct sales, um, EV charging, whatnot. Um, but one of the things I'd like to point out here is the EVs for Good program. This is a program that we at Renew Wisconsin manage. Um, it's for uh, mission-based nonprofits, and we provide up to 20% uh, of the total cost of a new or used electric vehicle. Um, we cap that at $5,000, but if it's an electric vehicle, van, or bus, we cap that at $10,000. Um, we also offer funding for um, a level two or a higher charging station. Um, so if this is something you, or if you know someone that, that would be interested in learning more about this, you know we're, we're certainly open to having those discussions. Okay, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, I'm going to pivot back to solar energy. Um, Heather introduced us to some of the large scale utility scale transmission level solar and some of the very large distribution uh, or utility owned uh, solar facilities. I'm going to talk a little bit about distributed solar. Um, in this case, this, this is, these are installations from a large commercial customers. Um, there is IKEA, American Family Insurance, and Madison College that utilize the large rooftop space that they have to install solar, and in these cases, over a megawatt each or a thousand kilowatts each installation. Um, a lot of these commercial and residential installations make use of the Focus on Energy program. If you're familiar with that, it's uh, a utility funded program that comes from, comes from customers' bills and implemented by a third party to provide energy efficiency and renewable energy incentives to utility customers. So in 2019, 768 homes used focus on energy, renewable energy incentives for PV installations in their home and 135 uh, commercial entities or government or nonprofit entities used uh, those PV incentives as well. Um, numbers we've gotten from the Solar Energy Industries Association for 2020 show a large amount of growth in the residential sector for um, photovoltaic installations of um, renewable energy resources on, on homes of utility customers, uh, but kind of levelized um, for businesses as well in 2020. Uh, so these installations not only provide benefits directly for the customers who install them, but for the economy in general. Um, entities that work on a clean energy jobs report put together a fact sheet and estimated 76,000 clean energy jobs exist right now in Wisconsin because of 
a variety of sectors, including energy efficiencies, such as the focus on energy program I was talking about, as well as renewable energy resource installations, such as wind and solar, uh, both at the transmission and the distribution levels. And one of the fastest growing uh, areas is advanced transportation, such as what Jeremy was discussing about EV stations and um, programs trying to get electric vehicles um, in, the, in the hands of um, customers in the state. Um, sorry, thank you. Uh, and also we like to collect stories of um, a lot of the, the workers who have jobs due to clean energy um, coming to the state of Wisconsin. You see uh, on the left, we've got Mike Lamont and Tyler. They all work for Sun Peak, which is a Wisconsin company that installs sol solar panels on residential and business uh, applications. And on the right is April uh, Smith. She uh, worked on the quilt block wind farm west of Madison. And she, there was a good write up piece on her in the news. She was quoted as saying, I'm always going to feel good driving past the turbines and seeing what we built. So it's always good to realize the, the economic impacts of uh, for the state of Wisconsin, as well as the individual uh, workers and their families are able to um, provide these uh, clean energy future for Wisconsin. Uh, community engagement. So um, Renew Wisconsin, just like uh, Rock County progressives, uh, work on um, engaging the community over these issues. And we're, you know, interested in building coalitions on special issues with, with you guys and with other entities as well. Um, and there's, there's uh, you know, specific issues we're going to talk about later in this presentation at, that relate to uh, budget, relate to legislation, relate to um, certain cases before the Public Service Commission, and we'll be talking a little bit about that further. Thank you, Andrew. So the governor's recent budget proposal, it's unprecedented. You know, it has 28 clean energy provisions that move us closer to, to clean energy and decarbonization. Um, again, this is, this is significant. It again demonstrates, you know, our political leadership paving the way for clean energy um, and setting the example for our communities, much like local governments are, are doing in the slide we saw earlier. Um, only now, this is at the highest level of, of government in the state of Wisconsin. So looking at some of the provisions, you know, we see the requirement for climate change plans and mitigation programs and the call for a renewable and clean energy research grant. But the one thing I want to point out here is the establishment of, a, of an Office of Sustainability and Clean Energy. Right now, the office is temporary and only has one employee, but the governor's proposal would create a permanent office that consistently focuses on clean energy, um, sustainability, and the diversification of the energy market, again, on a permanent basis. And so we touched on the governor's proposed $10 million in VW funds earlier. We know that's likely not going to happen. Um, it's likely going to be separate legislation introduced for $5 million alongside a clean energy grant for corridors. We don't quite know how that's going to look yet. We also don't know how necessarily it's going to look for the $700,000 uh, in VW funds for the state EV fleet. Um, but one thing I want to point out here is the, uh, the proposed $5 million in transportation funded bonding for EV stations. Um, that, that's significant. If we get that alongside that $5 million EV station legislation, um, for that combined $10 million, that, that's huge for the EV market right now. Um, you know, we have roughly over 350 stations in Wisconsin, but there are a lot of gaps that need to be filled still along some of the corridors and some rural and urban areas and just you know, a lot of public charging stations that we still need to help with the EV market growth that we're seeing. Um, so those two funding sources together could really help uh, kickstart the market with some much needed infrastructure throughout the state. Thanks, Jeremy. I wanted to touch based on a couple of focus on energy provisions in uh, Governor Evers budget as well. Um, right now, all utilities contribute 1.2% of their operating revenues to the focus on energy program. Uh, Governor Evers proposed to double that to 2.4%, which would add an additional $100 million uh, in focus on energy incentives, energy efficiency and renewable energy incentives. Um, the um, Republicans have not been supportive of this. It's not likely uh, to pass given the, um, the uh, composition of the legislature. Um, the other provision is related to low income households. There's not currently a standalone program within Focus on Energy that markets and targets directly low income um, customers, just residential customers at large. So Governor Evers again did um, put forward a budget item to, to require that with the expansion of, of Focus Energy program. Um, 
And Jeremy's going to talk about the PACE provisions. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. So I just want to point out here, you know, in addition to the two PACE provisions you see here, um, there are discussions underway to amend Wisconsin's CPAY statute right now to, to allow explicitly freebie stations. Um, we don't know how that's going to look. If it's going to be just DC fast charging stations or level two or both. Um, but this is important because right now, if you look at the if you look at the the statute the way it's written, it's kind of ambiguous. You could read it and interpret it to allow for stations or not allow for stations. So this amendment will just make it clear, very explicit that yes, you can use uh, pace financing here in Wisconsin for for EV stations. Also, want to touch base on an upcoming uh, webinar that uh, Renew Wisconsin is teaming up with a few organizations. Uh, the webinar is going to concentrate on focus on energy. It's going to be on June 29th. Um, some of the featured speakers will be Scott Blankman of Clean Wisconsin, Maddie Wazowitz of the Midwest Energy Efficiency Alliance, and Charles McGinnis of Johnson Controls. We're working to um, get a couple of more panelists lined up for this uh, webinar. We'll be focusing on um, the economic benefits to the state of Wisconsin, especially for those uh, businesses that can utilize this for some of those rooftop installations and en energy efficiency controls, uh, such as um, exist in the state of Wisconsin. There is a, a link to our, our registration for the webinar in the lower left-hand corner. I will copy and paste that into the chat at the end of the presentation if any of you are interested in attending that webinar. Um, we also want to talk with you about some legislative opportunities for collaboration coming up. Um, the first one of which is called third party financing. Um, right now, there's a legal gray area in the state of Wisconsin, and this is really case in point with um, a case before the Public Service Commission right now that involves We Energies based in Milwaukee and their denial of interconnection for a solar facility as proposed by the city of Milwaukee and the developer Eagle Point. Um, we Energy denied this interconnection based on the, the simple financing that would be established mostly on a cents per kilowatt hour basis. The utility said, hey, that's us, we're a utility, we're the only ones allowed to do that. And it's a, it's a fight right now before the Public Service Commission. We're expecting decisions soon from the Public Service Commission. However, we're not expecting certainty soon. Uh, on this, which is why the legislation is so important to clarify the statute that um, financing is available because this will allow essentially a model we call pay as you save so that you pay on a cents per kilowatt hours basis and then on your utility bill, uh, typically through a net metering, you'll receive a bill credit, which will you know, reduce your need to pay your energy charge every month for the amount of generation that the solar panels produce. So this is a great model. It, it reduces greatly the upfront cost that you, customers must pay in order to install solar on their rooftop and opens up the uh, market to middle, low to middle income uh, customers. Uh, second piece of legislation we want to discuss with you is community solar. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with this concept, but right now in Wisconsin, only utilities are allowed to offer uh, these programs and not many of them offer the programs and most of the programs which are offered by utilities are fully subscribed. So there's very little access in the state of Wisconsin right now for community solar. Um, it is a similar pay as you save type model with third party financing of customer owned uh, solar, but in this case, the customer doesn't have to install solar on one's rooftop. It is installed in a, um, more economies of scale in a proper place, uh, whether it be a farmer's field or a uh, brown field or someplace that allows for more economies of scale and easy interconnection to um, the distribution system and has the same model in which you pay the developer on a cents per kilowatt hour basis and then receive bill credits on your utility bill. Um, the same pay as you save model, like I said, the previous legislation would open up um, the market to low to middle income participation, which is, is a great option to have as far as working towards uh, universal access to renewable energy. So we're hoping that we can work with, um, with you guys and other organizations when developing a coalition webpage right now. It's not fully um, set up just yet, but we will make sure you guys get that when it is ready to go. Um, we're expecting legislation on this very soon, hopefully next week, and uh, we can get going on it. Um, 
And let me just say, I'm realizing as we're talking that we got really wonky really fast. <laughs> um, we're using a lot of jargon and acronyms here. So I want to apologize for that. And um, we can answer a lot of those questions in the chat. This will be available. This PowerPoint will be available to you um, after we're done. And we're happy to, to dive into any subject a little bit more. Um, we just have a few more slides to share with you. Uh, one resource that we built with uh, together with Sierra Club and Wisconsin Conservation Voters is something called we call the Wisconsin Clean Energy Toolkit.com. That's really expressly designed for groups like yours, for activists who are working with their local government or their school district or their university to help them shift to renewable energy. So you can download the report at this website. Um, we can also send you hard copies. We have hundreds of hard copies that we got printed through a grant. So we're happy to send those out to you if you find them useful. And in the report, um, sorry, got to get my cursor in the right place. You will find information about financing clean energy for local governments. Um, I see Susan has a question here about how to finance um, electric vehicles for fleets. Um, and Jeremy can answer that in a second. Um, there's other financing resources here, different grant programs through the state um, and uh, financing models. Um, I won't go into them because I want to save a lot of times for questions, but this is all of these details are in the report or in the, the toolkit rather. Um, we go through how you initiate your planning processes and what resources to utilize to begin these processes. I know many of you have been involved in, in, in this work. Um, we highlight the importance of planning for equity from the beginning um, in any anything you do, but as, as you're planning for renewable energy, it's important to be thinking about diversity the whole way through so that um, you don't result in any worsening of disparities or any unintended consequences for um, underserved communities. There's also a lot of opportunities to rectify inequities if you do it right. Um, we've had a number of uh, affordable housing projects all around Wisconsin add renewable energy. Um, and that's really exciting. We're also working with multifamily buildings to put renewable energy on them. And we're working on the policy issues of how do you make sure all the tenants benefit from this solar on a rooftop of a multifamily. That's actually a tricky policy issue. And we finally, we lay out some action steps. You know, how are the different, the different main categories of work and how you can get through them um, in this toolkit. So that's a resource available to you. We are a resource available to you. We're really happy to be here today. And, um, I just want to thank you for your patience and definitely <laughs> tell us what we were jargony about because I feel like there was a lot of jargon. I was trying to look at this from your perspective and we get so immersed in our own renewable energy worlds that sometimes we can go wonky. So that's it. Um, we're ready for questions. And did you want me to start answering questions that are EV related that were in the chat box there. Well, how, however, you want to do this, Chuck. Do you moderate the yeah. or what's can the? You, can you unshare your screen just so that? Um, yes. Let me something critical that. we need to see. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, everybody. Great. Now, now it's uh, your turn. Um, maybe we should, you know, emphasize at first the questions raised in the chat. Um, that's a great place to raise questions. In addition to, uh, you know, folks want to raise your hands or, you know, just jump in. That's fine too. It's not disruptive. So hey Chuck, if you don't mind, I could just start addressing those two questions. Sure. That Susan. Okay. Yeah, sure. So Susan, great question. You know, what is a fast charger? I think this goes with Heather saying a lot of our industry lingo that we get so used to, to saying. So to keep it simple, there are three levels of charging stations, level one, level two, level three. Um, each one gives you a higher output of power. I mean, let me know if I'm getting too technical again or too jargony for industry. Um, but basically, a DC fast charger, it starts at a 50 kilowatt output for the charging station, and it's DC. Um, it's, it's really what's going to do, it's going to give you a faster charge than a level two would, and a level two would give you a faster charge than a level one. That's kind of the simple, all around basic way of explaining it. We can get into some averages and numbers if you'd like, but that's kind of generally what it is. You're going to see those more common around uh, corridors. Um, Reason being, when you're traveling from point A to point B, let's say you're going from Madison to you know Minneapolis or somewhere in California, wherever it may be, you're going to have those faster charging stations on corridors, so you can just stop, plug in, grab a bite to eat for five minutes, fifteen minutes, charge your vehicle, and then hit the road. Um, whereas for like a level two for a public charging station, that's going to be more or less a, a, like a concert venue. 
a sporting venue, a, a workplace, somewhere where you're going to be sitting a little longer to get the charge. And then a level one, typically you can get that at, it'll be at your house um, that, you know, the, the output, the cord for that comes with the vehicle, plug it in your garage, or you can hit level two of the house too. Um, if that, does that answer your question, Susan? Does that kind of? <laughs> Susan, you out there? I think I see her nodding. She might be muted still. Well, let's go on to the next question. I thought that was sure. very helpful, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. So the first one, how much electric fire trucks cost? That's a tough one because they're kind of newer on the market. Um, There's one in California last year that was rated for over a million dollars, I believe. Um, but I can, get, I can get you some specific information because Madison just unveiled their first electric fire truck last night. Um, so I, I can get that specific info from their fleet supervisor as to exactly how much it cost. Um, I know their infrastructure was a little smaller than I had anticipated. I think they have a, a 150 K watt output charger. I, I had anticipated something a little higher. Um, and so going, going to the electric buses, the school buses can cost anywhere from like 200,000 roughly to 400,000. Um, and to get those funded, oftentimes municipalities will either do like um, let's say their transportation budget, they want to transfer their fleet over to EVs. They have like what, every year they do like an attrition, rate of attrition, how many vehicles they want to convert, and they kind of fix that into their budget or not. Um, but as we know, EVs and the charging infrastructure can be quite expensive. So they'll also get grant funding. You know, VW settlement helps a lot with that, a lot with that actually with funding. Um, and there are other local and state level funding mechanisms, depending where you go, like utility rebate programs for charging infrastructure. Um, you know, the energy office, um, energy innovation grant here, um, some federal programs that offer a lot of funding as well, but that's typically how it is. It really depends on the municipality, what their budget looks like, what their needs are, how much they need and what their goals are going forward. And they'll kind of, they'll kind of mix and match their budget with some funding opportunities, whatnot. Um, but Susan, if you wanted a specific example, I could reach out to Madison too, to their fleet supervisor. They have a lot of EVs. They've done a lot of great work for the years. And you know, maybe for a future presentation or just a brief update, we could give you those numbers of exactly how they kind of, how they planned it out anyways. Um, does that, does that help, Susan? <laughs> okay, um, Janet has her hand raised. Um, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm wondering about, um, you know, you're talking about these charging stations at the corridors where traffic goes, but we go up north, straight north, um, you know, and uh, if we got an energy uh, an efficient vehicle, the electric thing, um, I have no idea where we would charge that. And I'm, my question is, um, is this a scarcity related to broadband issues or is that Entirely different thing. Yeah, great question. It's different. It's a scarcity due to, I don't want to say the EV market's new because we've been around for quite a few years, but as far as the EV market at a tipping point, that's last couple of years, we're really starting to see a push from the consumer side. And so with that and with increased funding, we're able to start rolling out infrastructure more. So that's there, there are a lot of things that we're kind of holding it back, not necessarily broadband. Um, and as far as how to locate stations, so you, you saw where I had that map up earlier. I pulled that from the, it's called the Alternative Fuels Data Center. You can go there and look up any station anywhere, including Canada. So US and Canada, if you wanna travel, you can map a route. Um, but you're right, cause up north in some of the spots, it's pretty, I'm from the UP originally, it's pretty barren there as well. Um, I, I had this discussion with my parents two weeks ago, um, you know, the same thing. So we're trying to roll out infrastructure as we get increased funding. Um, and part of that is just identifying where we need infrastructure in some of those rural areas up north, some of the, uh, tourist destinations, you know, Wisconsin Dells and other places like that, that really need the infrastructure. So those plans are ongoing. Um, but yeah, we're, we're definitely moving in that direction. Well, I, I just want to respond by saying I, I appreciate that, but we don't go to the Dells, which is a popular area. Um, we don't go to Manaqua, which is another popular area. We just go up the, straight up the state um, to like near Rhinelander or Tomahawk, and I, I have never seen a place where I could plug in. And I, we'd love to have an electric car, you know? But, I, so you probably answered that, and I'm just expressing my frustration. 
Oh no, I get it. No, it's 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 range anxiety. That's one of the main barriers. Range anxiety. Yeah. People want to know yeah. where they can charge. Um, yeah. Well, we have 300 mile ranges on a lot of vehicles, but you still want to know you can charge when you get there. So yeah. you know, the plans are underway now. We don't know exactly where those stations will be located. Um, but plans are underway to kind of identify those areas up north and elsewhere in the state to kind of deploy infrastructure. So hopefully, you know, those areas that you like to travel, hopefully you'll get those in there as well. And maybe Jeremy, could you put in in the chat the alternative fuels data center links? Yeah, absolutely. Um, people could go check out some of those resources. I do think I'm I'm an I'm a regular Prius hybrid owner, not an EV owner myself. And I, I do think that. It, um, some of the early adopters of EVs are used to, you know, they go on apps and they download the maps for all the charging stations. It's not like a gas station where it's easily signed and it's everywhere. Um, although Quick Trip is in talks with potentially adding charging stations to their gas stations. So once that happens, once we break that tipping point, this is going to be a whole different ballgame. Right now, though, you kind of have to be a little bit techie and interested in looking up your maps and planning your trip ahead and all this stuff. So, um, and some of the charging stations themselves want you to have an app on your phone to connect to the charger, blah, blah, blah. But worst case scenario, I did drive an EV all the way to Platteville, not having a big charge to start with um, on a windy day, which I didn't know also affects your charge. <laughs> um, and, you know, we were in a little bit of a crisis and we didn't know what to do. So we actually just plugged into the building. We were at a library doing a presentation. They had an exterior plug and we literally just plugged into the regular plug. So in a worst case scenario, any outlet will do. So that's good. <laughs> that's okay, good. I'm, I'm gonna say too, I wanna add to this, that I'm we're not gonna drive all over hell to find a charging station. Well, right. <laughs> we just wanna get there, you know? Yes. Yeah, that's that's completely understandable. Like others said, a lot of the early adopters, they didn't care. They'd go out of their way. I know a guy back in Michigan, he went out of his way 3,000 miles to prove he could charge free all the time. Like, like Tom, not everyone's going to do that. You're, you're, you're even for an early adopter, you're the only one that's going to do that. Yeah. So, I mean, the, you know, that's why we need to see this, the, the VW funding, that's going to be huge. Once we get that funding, that 5 million, and if we get the transportation uh, funded bonding alongside of that, that's going to be huge. We're going to be able to plug up a lot of gaps in the state so folks feel comfortable traveling and charging. Um, I can't help but ask a question along those lines. I mean, how optimistic? I mean, I guess I kind of feel like the Republicans are blocking everything that's good in the world. I, and maybe that's an exaggeration. So where are the pressure points and how likely, what could we do specifically to get it moving and can it really happen? Yeah, sure. Great question. Um, a lot of the legislation EV related we're seeing now is actually being proposed by Republicans. Um, so which, which is good. We have that bipartisan support and a lot of these legislative items are being pushed. You know, their, their view is a free market perspective. They see the CDB market. That's great. That's, you know, but because of that, they're seeing the market, they've seen how it shifted in the last couple of years. And so they're really pushing this legislation forward now. Um, in fact, the $5 million VW legislation is going to be introduced by a Republican in Wisconsin. So that's good. Wow. I see there's good by, you know, good bipartisan support for these issues that we find, you know, that we all hold near and dear. Well, why, why, what was the problem? What was the holdback on that for a while? I think a lot of it was just market driven, just different philosophy and how things should roll out when it comes to the market, whatnot. Um, those of us that have been in the industry for a while, I mean, we see the writing on the wall four years ago, three years ago. Um, but I think, so I can't speak for Wisconsin specifically last fall in the early, early winter, but I can say like elsewhere, um, you know, once GM made that announcement in, in, the, in the winter, I think that people are like, all right, this is, this is real now. It, it has been real, but when GM, like a major OEM comes out and says, hey, we're going to have all electric vehicles by such and such year, that speaks volumes to the market. You can't argue with the market data at that point. Um, not to say Republicans here weren't already kind of interested in proposing these legislative items around that time or a little before. But the market's there now. Well, I see that uh, Ford is uh, proposing an F10 that's uh, going to be driven by electricity. Yeah, that's one. <laughs> so there's some challenge. I see a I see a great question in the chat um, that I'd love to address if that's all right. Um, sure. Jim is, Jim Farrell is asking. Um, about revisiting solar assessments that they did 10 years ago for the fire station and the transit centers. 
I don't want to pull up that slide again and, and, and bore you with more PowerPoint slides, but as you could see, the costs have dropped for solar, you know, almost 90% in the last 10 years. So yes, the short answer is yes, get a new solar site assessment um, and reassess the energy costs of that facility. Um, and it will be a very different economic <laughs> situation. There's also more um, financing options, even though we don't have clarity on third party financing in Wisconsin yet. Um, there are green bonds available and there are um, a lot of financing mechanisms that, mechanisms that would be available both to local governments and other entities. So I would definitely take another look. We have solar and solar members on our website that um, you know, in most cases offer free site assessments and free uh, uh, cost assessments and, and how much your, your, your site would produce, how much energy your site would produce, how much money you would save. So we would encourage you to definitely do that. Okay, so can I take team that just at a real high level economics tariff? Um, you're, you're addressing the cost uh, perspective and on the benefits perspective, um, each utility tariff is different. Some are better than others with regards to net metering and buyback rates, as we call them, which would make the business case for you to install the solar on your uh, rooftop of the fire station. Um, I don't know what utility you have. It would be good to know that. And I could work with you on the side just to kind of assess the utility tariff for one. And then, yeah, ultimately, you'd have to work with uh, the developer for a site assessment and, and the cost assessment. But you also should know what the utility uh, tariff looks like and what kind of deal you'd be getting from the utility as well. Right. I just want I just want to speak um, to that I'll kind of thing. That hand up, um, Janet. Um, what I need to put my hand up, Chuck. Well, Paula had her hand up. Oh, so oh I'm Paula. sorry. Paula. That's okay, Janet. Send me. I also ask the people who do put their hands up by Zoom put them back down when they're done. That's a common thing that people do. It's not a huge deal. It's just if you want to be called on again. So another one of those. Uh, question, uh, when you were talking about financing the weather, weatherizing uh, for low income people and stuff like that, low income people rent. So you, what you're doing is you're helping the landlords, right? How does that help the renter? I mean, it, maybe it lowers their energy or something, but you're, I don't know, it just seems like you're paying these landlords to improve their buildings. <laughs> Well, yes and yes, right? So investing in reducing energy costs, it, it, it does translate to, it should, if you, there's a couple ways to do it, right? But if, if a renter is paying their utilities, then any energy efficiency improvement you make on that building benefits the renters directly, right? Because they pay, yeah. if they have a leaky building and they're paying utilities, that energy, those energy costs are just flying out the window. So. Um, that's really important. One thing we're trying to figure out is if you put solar on a rooftop of a multifamily building, um, right now, <laughs> right now there's some ar sort of archaic rules that say you have to, um, you can only use that energy that you're producing on the building for the common space, unless you add um, meters for every unit and connect those meters to the solar system which is extraordinarily expensive and sort of defeats the whole purpose of trying to save money. Um, but we would like to find a policy solution. We think there is a, pol a simple policy solution to, to sort of uh, meter the building as a whole and allow, um, allow the, all the tenants to take advantage of the solar you put on a rooftop to reduce their energy costs. So yeah, it, it, does, all, it does all fit back together. And there is a, uh, a multifamily program that Focus on Energy currently has. It's not targeted to low income specifically, but it does provide if, if the landlord is in charge of the upgrades for the facility, in this case, uh, building for uh, tenants, um, they would have incentives to do that, which would then benefit all the tenants and make their building more attractive to uh, tenants in the future. We're even working with a landlord who's just really interested in renewable energy um, in the Green Bay area, who, who's trying to do this, this uh, building-wide metering issue so that they can, um, I think they're paying utilities in most cases, and they can pass that savings on to their 
renters, or they can do other investments to Im improve the quality of the building. So you are saving money and then how that savings is spent, how it's, whether it's passed on or whether it's, um, it benefits, just benefits, you know, profit margins, you know, that's, that's debatable, but certainly we want to save money on energy whenever possible. Um, there's so much great questions in the chat. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you, Chuck, to decide what's next. Okay. Well, um, Janet, did you want to Offer another question? I probably did, but right now I can't remember. All right, well, I did, I offer one. I did want to say, though, Chuck, that um, years ago, Mark and I wanted to put solar on our roof. And of course, it was expensive then. Uh, and we finally decided not to do it because we'd be dead before, you know, we'd be, we'd be in any profits. So that whole issue of paybacks. You know, if you have your electricity, if you're bringing it in from the solar, I mean, I thought that was an idea that had gone away. I, I'm not, I'm asking that is, is it true that you can still get money back from the energy company on your overage? Yeah, I had a similar question. I mean, I keep seeing these ads on Lyant or whatever office saying, oh, you can put solar on your house. And, and I haven't looked into it, but I'm a little suspicious of it. And then I'm also wondering if things are going to get better. Is there a reason to wait to do that to your own house? I own my house, so I don't know. What should I do? I can address that. It's somewhat similar to what I was talking about, the fire station. Uh, right now, it's a hodgepodge of utility uh, tariffs across the state of Wisconsin. Uh, each utility is different and electric tariffs, man. I'm sorry, that's one of those wonky words. What do you mean by tariffs? Tariff <laughs> sets the rate at which the which the utility pays you for um, energy that leaves your house and goes on to the distribution okay. grid. Gotcha. And we, can uh, we can't help ourselves. <laughs> yeah, um, and, well, while Andrew's talking, if it's okay, I'd like to share my screen again and show you a fact sheet that talks helps homeowners think about how what whether it'll make sense to go solar. But keep keep talking, Andrew. Sure. Um, so it is. It's hard for for customers to understand because it's you know maybe if your your long distance neighbor or your friend lives in a different utility service territory, they're going to have a different economics or a business case for their solar. So long story short. Uh, the commission has opened up an investigation to look at these issues, why it's so different across utilities across the state of Wisconsin. We're pushing, of course, for uh, more favorable buyback rates to make a better business case uh, for all utility customers. Um, and utilities prefer utility scale transmission interconnected resources that they own and operate as preferable to customer own. So it's a, it's a dynamic that we are navigating. We're trying to create more access for renewable energy for all Wisconsin customers. So um, again, I would be happy to understand what your utility is and be able to look at that, that document, the tariff document to understand um, what, what kind of business case you might have. Uh, net metering is the best case scenario. We should be available. Uh, I'm not sure about cooperative utilities, but municipal and investor-owned utilities should, should, all order, should all have net metering, which basically reduces the amount of energy on your bill and you then avoid the energy charge. So if you pay 10 cents or 15 cents per kilowatt hour for the energy used to, to you know, keep, keep your home uh, lighted and, and heated, et cetera, then you're avoiding that. You're basically powering your house by the uh, solar energy and it's able to be net on a monthly basis. So even if you're gone during the middle of the day and a little bit of excess goes on the grid instantaneously, you're still able to get credit for that and avoid your energy charges. All right, I don't know what's going on with my screen, but I just pulled up that fact sheet um, it's also in the chat. If you click on that link in the chat, Renew Wisconsin has a fact sheet um, on our website for homeowners who are looking to go solar. And it walks through um, an example of, um, you know, what it costs up front and all the rebates you can get. And then it even dives into, as Andrew was saying, the different rates for each utility. So um, in my case, I went solar in 2016. So a big part of uh, my budget was the fact that I, I was able to access the 30% tax credit 
So each year that tax credit is ramping down. So each year you wait to go solar, you lose a little bit more of that tax credit and that tax credit will disappear in a couple of years. So there's one incentive to sort of get it done in the near future. Um, and then um, I was able to access a focus on energy rebate. And at the time that was a very generous rebate back in 2016, I think I got, I saved like, I got $2,500 back, something like that, which is a lot. Um, right now the focus on energy rebate is shrunk to $500 for residential customers. And you, you can envision a scenario where that focus on energy rebate also goes away. So you've got the tax credit ramping down, you've got the focus on energy rebate ramping down. Um, luckily costs continue to go on down at the same time. So um, in my case, um, the total cost of my system was about $14,000 up front. Um, with my rebates and my tax credit, um, it got down to around $9,000, $9,500 um, actual outlay. Um, and for me, because of the amount I pay for each each unit of energy for, through my utility at Madison Gas and Electric, and because of the way they structure their the way they credit my bill for all the solar energy I push out, push, produce and push out back on, onto the grid. My system will be paid off in about seven or eight years maximum. And my system will operate for a total of probably 25 years. So for me, that's like a super good deal because when I, I'm already saving money on my bill and over time I'll be saving a lot of money, um, especially as energy rates, the amount you pay on your energy bill is just probably going to continue to go up over time. It's always a, uh, it's a, a very, you're predicting the future when we try to figure out what utility rates will be five, 10 years from now. So you can never really do that, but in general, they go up. And so when you, you hedge against that by producing your own clean energy, so you, you will save money over time. The question is just how much depending on your system, your roof, your utility, and how much energy you use. So we at Renew, actually, who's on the call here who's running the group by? Um, that person probably has a lot of explanations that they can share about renewable energy as well um, and how to go solar simply and easily. I forget who that was. Who's on the It's me, it's me, Frankie. Yes, oh. I don't know if Frankie wants to talk about the group buy, and, and that's a good way for folks to get um, some great um, information and to find a simple way to go solar. Well, this is the second group buy program we've hosted in Jefferson County. The first one was a couple of years ago, and I, that's, I got my solar with that first group buy. And what you do, they, we collect um, names of individuals who are interested and um, we pro they're provided with a free quote and how much it's gonna cost and how much their, um, their um, anticipated savings might be. You have to have your last year's worth of electric bills um, with you but it's real simple after that. Our, the company we're using this time around is called All Solar Energy. And the other company that we used before was um, Full Spectrum from Madison. I know they've done a lot of work in uh, Madison, but All Solar is a larger company and um, we're pretty excited about them. And uh, that's it. I uh, started saving um, money almost right away on my regular uh, electric bills. And since then, I've been really excited about the other opportunities for lowering my carbon footprint. I've got an EV bicycle, and we just, I bought a Prius hybrid, and I just bought a new electric lawnmower. So the, uh, it's, it, it's, it's provided me personally with some savings and some inspiration. 
Sounds great, Frankie. So folks have other questions. We have lots of uh, great info coming up in the chat. And uh, it looks like if folks do want to go solar themselves, there's lots of resources out there. And, and it looks like the way to do it is, I'm not sure how you form a group, group by, but I imagine you just have to organize with a bunch of people to do it. It sounds like that, especially to progressives. It sounds like you need to form a cooperative or something, but it's a term of art. It really just means that we, in. Uh, in the case of the Madison Solar Group by in, in Madison and Frankie with her group, um, we've actually done all that work for you. All you need to do is sign up, right? So we've we've negotiated the price. Right. We've got the we've got all the information. You just sign up and then you get the deal. So that's the benefit. So um, this YouTube link I just put in here for you. Um, that is the city of Madison sponsored group by that, that renew runs. And actually it was my gateway into renewable energy. I signed up for Madison. I went solar. It was super easy. I didn't have to think about it. I thought it was, I thought I'd have to arrange a group of people <laughs> also to sign up together, but no, the work is done for you. So we do regular webinars about how to go solar with that program and a lot of the information, what type of roof, what angle of your roof, how do I calculate what this will cost me? All of that information is available in these videos on that, at that link on that website. Andrew is an expert from the Public Service Commission, so he can dive deep as deep as you want to go. But if you just want like a quick 101 at your convenience, check out that link and all of our other resources on madisonsolar.com. It's super helpful. And that is sponsored by the city of Madison. So it's, you know, it's a really great program. Hey, um, Janet has a question. Well, we've been talking a lot about individual solar projects on your house and so on and so on. Right. Uh, Mark and I just went out to Kansas City um, recently on a trip and, and um, Illinois and um, Iowa, they have windmills all over the place they're not like littered with them but i mean they are taking advantage of that kind of wind power thing and i i just think that seems like such a great idea they're um graceful and nice to look at and i uh, is that happening here any i know there's that area in fond du lac where there's a lot of windmills but anywhere else in wisconsin I think I think that was part of the presentation, right? Um, I missed that, maybe. Yeah, we saw where the windmills were, and I will be putting this presentation up on YouTube. Assuming that's, I assume that's good with the folks at Renew, right? You don't mind I. That's right. This is all all for the yeah. public. Um, we do have on our website, we have fact sheets on all these specific topics. So we have a fact sheet that shows where the existing wind farms are. Um, the map I showed you today is really about. Uh, perspective wind farms, potential new wind farms. Uh -huh. but we have we have probably like a dozen wind farms in Wisconsin today, um, a total of 737 megawatts of wind. What does that mean? Um, so what does that, that mean? Megawatts, how many windmills is that? Well, they're changing in size. So, so because of that, the, the amount of energy they produce is quite varied. Um, so how do I want to answer that question? Andrew, do you have a sense of how many homes could be powered by, well, you could say, I mean, I think you could power approximately 120,000, 150,000 homes on that much energy in Wisconsin. Really ballpark, extremely ballpark back of the envelope numbers. That's enough wind to power over 100,000 homes, maybe, maybe 150,000 homes. And do we have enough space, like space open, like planes or whatever it is you need to have a lot more? Um, we do. It's a great farms? question. It's a great question because as um, as these solar farms and wind farms are moving forward, people are asking that, you know, is this a good use of land? How much land are we really talking about? So we've done other uh, rough back of the envelope calculations. We think we could produce up to 50% of Wisconsin's total um, electricity needs with solar um, with approximately 1% of the ag land, the land in ag use in Wisconsin right now today. 
And we're using more than that for ethanol production today anyway. So that's, and the thing I didn't mention about solar farms is that all of the equipment or the majority of the equipment is removable at the end of the life of the project. This is not a permanent conversion of ag land to some other use. This is a temporary use of ag land. And the way that solar um, systems are installed, you're installing steel posts and you put the racks on the posts. We're not pouring, um, you know, this is not pouring concrete, creating a subdivision. You can remove those posts after the project. You can farm again or whatever that land needs to be after the life of the project. But you can also farm right around it, can't you? Um, in a limited way, but there are some projects that are doing grazing you know, um, with mm -hmm. and things like that. And you can certainly grow, especially shade loving vegetables. Um, and I think we're exploring that more and more what can be done with that. And Janet, I wanted to add that, you know, Iowa is one of the best wind resources in the United States. That was a reason why there was heavy investment in wind turbines uh, in Iowa uh, in specifically. And also are you, because of the highway transmission system that the utilities are all interconnected we actually some of our Wisconsin utilities either own or have contracts for uh, some of the wind power in Iowa and southern I'm sorry northern Illinois um, because of the interconnected nature of the transmission system um, so we do have wind turbines in Wisconsin are powering Wisconsin customers and we do also have wind turbines in in Iowa and Illinois that are also powering our homes as well. I was also um, thinking, and Chuck, you can shut, cut me off at any point here. We want to wrap things up soon, folks. So okay. Uh, you, the white. Great Plains states, uh, where there's wind all the time, like South Dakota and those kinds of things, and they're they're hugely farming out there. Um, and maybe this is beyond your expertise, but wouldn't it be better to have lots of wind farms and lots of fall off the ground farms? Do you say, wouldn't it be better to have wind farms than, than what? Plow off the ground farms. Off the ground farms? Well, they're plowing up the land there. Oh. Um, thousands and thousands of acres in there. And it's exposing it to the winds that are there uh, and putting um, pesticides and fertilizers and all that stuff and impacting the soil and all that kind of stuff. Right. Well, I'm just wondering if it might be cheaper to have lots of wind farms out there. It's wind farms are are very economical. <laughs> yes, they are. For well, sure. I mean, I, as an alternative, you don't have to make your money. Yes, it's a good the way they're doing. Right, it's a good. Um, it's a good. Uh, we call it a drought resistant cash crop. Ah, yes, yes, good. I like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, I want to ask. One, <laughs> this would be the last question. I'm going to get it in myself. Um, a lot of this, of course, depending on the federal government and the state governments to provide the kind of resources, support, legislation, and all that to make it possible. What can be done at the municipal level, and what should we be doing to pressure, encourage municipalities to do what they can to adopt renewables, et cetera? You know, um Janesville made that commitment to clean energy, um, which was fantastic. Beloit made that commitment to clean energy. Um, more and more county governments are making um, bold commitments to clean energy. And that that's important, that's vital, um, but that really is the first step. Then you need to begin implementing. And it does take a lot of staff work and it takes a lot of leadership um, to continue to implement. Dane County has put together a climate action plan, which is a tremendous resource for other counties looking to shift to renewable energy. Um, depending where your county government is on this issue, you might be at a different stage of the political uh, buy-in. Um, we're here to help. I know that we really briefly talked about the local government toolkit, but we wanna help you there's, and our partner organizations wanna help you too. So if you have a subcommittee or a team of people who are interested in pushing the leadership or just working with staff, connecting them to the resources um, and giving them encouragement that they need, that's what we are here to help with. Um, it's, a, you know, it's a longer conversation, but um, we know you're the folks on the ground working with your local elected officials, in some case, being your local elected officials. And we are here to 
provide you the support, local governments really, really are leading the way. Evers would not have been able to um, make the bold commitments he, he'd made without the, the dozens and dozens of cities in Wisconsin and villages in Wisconsin that have started to push the needle forward um, because they've proven you can make progress and it is good for the community. And so um, really there's, there's no impetus for the state government like local government action. All right, well. If I could interrupt just real quick. Right, if Fort Atkinson, they're developing, they got some property and they're gonna be developing a new neighborhood. And our heart of the city group has um, been in contact with them regularly. And one of our members was an engineer and he helped them look at that property and how they could develop it using some geothermal resources because our schools are all heated and cooled with geothermal and the development of this neighborhood is going to be with geothermal and we're, they're also going to require that a certain percent of the roofs on any new housing in this neighborhood be directed toward being advantageous for solar roofing. That's exciting. That's so exciting, Frankie. It's well, it, it feels like a real victory for it us. Is. That's huge. Eau Claire is doing that too, but I had no idea this was happening in Fort Atkinson. It's fantastic. I know it was still kind of a secret, so I won't tell anybody. <laughs> I, you didn't hear it from me. Okay. <laughs> That's great. All right, well, um, we reached the point at which usually I say, give our speakers a big hand. Yay, thank you very much for informative. We know there's lots of resources out there and now we all gotta knuckle down and learn all this stuff so we can figure out how to enter the brave new world of renewables and uh, thanks guys. So I want to wish everyone a good evening and um, hopefully we'll see folks back. We'll always meet the second Wednesday of each week, uh, I mean each month, and I hope to see you in July and then in person in August. So take care, everybody. Thank you, Thank you so much. for having us. Great conversation. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye all. Bye. Thank you.